right. I'm going to take just a second for everyone to join, but welcome. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brittany Higginbotham. I am a communications and outreach manager with the Institute for Public Relations. Um, appreciate you all joining us today. Uh, please share in the chat where you are calling in from. We have an international audience for all of our webinars and um, our panel panelists would love to hear where you're calling in from. Um, but yes, I would like to just say a couple uh, notes about the Institute for Public Relations in case you are new to us or um, we've been, we're changing all the time. So um, the Institute for Public Relations is a 501c3 nonprofit foundation. We're dedicated to fostering the greater use of research and research-based um, knowledge in the public relations and corporate communications practice. We have a ton of resources in our research library um, for all levels of professionals. Um, we also have opportunities to connect with other professionals across the industry and also internationally through from the start of their career through our IPR Next membership program and also our IPR Elevate membership program for mid to senior level professionals. Please uh, let me know if you're interested in any of those. We can share more information as well, um, but we'd love to see you all more involved. Um, so before I get started, I want to introduce some of our speakers. Today, we have a fantastic panel featuring um, the pro CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Provoke, Arun Sadhaman. He's going to um, moderate this panel today. And we also have uh, Ilan Chow, Global Chief Commun Chief Growth Officer and Managing Director for Asia and Greater China for Ruder Finn. We have Rumi Harandran, Senior Director of Corporate Affairs and Asia, Middle East, and Africa at Kalanova. And last but definitely not least, Dr. Sulin Yao, Associate Professor of Communication Management at Singapore Management University. Um, and now before I hand it off, I would like to just say a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you have any tech difficulties throughout the webinar, please message me or any IPR staff member um, to will help resolve it. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback within 48 hours. Um, and we will have a Q&A portion at the end of the session um, with our audience. So if you have any questions, please share in the chat or Q&A box, and we will make sure we ask those questions to our panelists. Um, and then with that, we will transition to our webinar on future proofing communications and insights from the latest um, Asia Pacific comms index. With that, I'll hand it over to Arun to get us started. Thank you very much, Brittany, um, and welcome everyone to uh, to today's webinar. It's great to see uh, so many people checking in from all over the world. Um, I saw we have people from the US, from Trinidad, from Philippines, from Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong. Um, so it's great to see we have a worldwide audience. Um, I'll just say a few words first um, about the Asia Pacific Communications Index. Uh, this is a study which uh, Provoke Media conducts in conjunction with the Asia Pacific Association of Communication Directors. Um, and of course, with, with Ruda Finn, we've been running it now for three years. We poll um, over 120 senior in-house communicators, um, specifically uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and we, um, we aim to shed light on the evolving communications landscape in the region. Um, and so what we're going to do today uh, in a bid to help you future-proof your communication strategies is highlight some of the key findings from the last uh, study, which came out um, around five, four, four months ago. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at the findings that relate to uh, artificial intelligence um, and to ESG, uh, because I think they underscore the, the, the critical role played by communications professionals in today's uh, business landscape, but also the the, the changing nature of that role um, and and the opportunity opportunities and threats um, that these issues bring. Um, so, before I ask questions, I wanted to highlight some of the findings um, that we'll be talking about. Um, and as mentioned, there are two areas in particular we're going to focus on: AI uh, and ESG. Um, so, the first finding is that according to uh, the most recent Asia Pacific Comms Index, uh, as you can see in front of you on the screen, um, forty-eight percent of respondents um, are either not sure 
or don't think that tools like ChatGPT can effectively automate routine tasks in communications. Um, when we asked um, about usage and familiarity, uh, there were also some perhaps surprising findings. Less than a third uh, of our respondents um, are familiar with the tools, um, while an even smaller proportion, uh, just uh, just fourteen percent, um, are, are using them always or usually. Um, so it seems like there are concerns um, in terms of familiar familiarity, um, and at best. Uh, in-house communications uh, leaders and executives in Asia Pacific, at least, um, are using them on a on an experimental um, or perhaps sporadic uh, basis. Um, I want to contrast this uh, with a study from the U.S. Um, from the Conference Board, uh, which came out last year, uh, and that found that sixty percent uh, of respondents from communications um, are now using AI at least sometimes um, in their daily work. Um, as there was in general far more positivity in the US about these tools. So perhaps we 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 will talk about whether you know some of these concerns are um are related at all to geographic factors. Um, a couple more findings that uh, we'll highlight. Um, what limitations do you think tools like ChatGPT have in terms of creativity um, and human judgment? Uh, almost half of in-house comms respondents think that generative AI tools cannot handle complex or sensitive information. Um, while there are also concerns about limitations in terms of language nuance, creativity, and empathy. So these are the AI findings that we'll highlight, uh, and I'll quickly run through a couple of the ESG findings as well that we will talk about. So when we asked how important has ESG become to your role as a communications leader, almost 70% uh, see ESG as extremely or very important to their roles. Um, and we also asked whether our respondents, our respondents are seeing any evidence of an ESG backlash from their key stakeholders. Um, and only around a third said that they are. And, you know, we are, I think, all aware that uh, perhaps in other parts of the world, um, there is a much more tangible ESG backlash. And indeed, um, in the US, for example, there is there is a, a trend of, of not even using the phrase ESG anymore um, because of the, uh, the, the political backlash it attracts, um, along with uh, perhaps this kind of trend we're seeing towards green hushing. Um, so we will talk about all of these things. I'm going to go back to the very start um, for my first question. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward question I wanted to start with for all of our panelists today. Um, uh, by the way, please feel free to, um, as Brittany mentioned, to put your questions um, into the Q&A box or, uh, or into the chat, and we will, we will get to them towards the end of the webinar. Um, so my first question is, you know, how, how exactly is artificial intelligence transforming um, the landscape for each of the panelists on the call today? Um, and, and perhaps why do they think um, we're seeing this level of resistance uh, in this region? Um, and Ilan, if I could start with you, please. Okay, hi. 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 Hello, everyone. It's great to see everybody here. Um, so um, it's a very important question because we asked ourselves many, many times. So uh, the role of AI actually evolves very, very fast um, because it is it itself is evolving very fast. And at the beginning, we think it's only uh, capable of doing some very mechanic works like translations, like uh, developing the um, some article drafts and grasp the data online. Then we realize it can do a lot more than uh, our original thoughts. So today, what we are doing, this, the first step is we're doing some drafts and generate some ideas. You know, AI is very good in generating ideas, which has a... Um, initial thoughts put everybody into discussion in a brainstorming you know or things like that 
then we realize without any capability of uh, paintings or creativity, you can also um, do creative images as well as videos. This is the capability right now. Our team is developing in each unit. I'm very surprising to see how young people can learn these skills. So they, they really get it very, very fast. I think it's faster than I can do that. Um, it's interesting that uh, in some of the crisis simulations, we ask AI, um, ChatGPT, assume you are a New York Times reporter, what questions you're going to ask. I'll give you surprise questions. <laughs> okay, it's a great simulation tool. They know the newspaper, they know the media, they'll ask appropriate, sometimes very sharp questions that uh, sometimes you just miss them in your daily practice. And then we realize it's also a great proof reading person. You know, when you write a press release, you ask them what's the key message you've got from this press release. Sometimes you, it will surprise you. You think you talk about A, it actually give you B. Okay, so these are all the things that we gradually learned during our use of the AI tools. Today, we are also trying the others. For instance, we are trying to do meeting summaries and some of the long email summaries with Copilot. You know, in offices, you have the emails like forward, 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 that long. And you just hate go back to the long email chain. Then you realize Copilot can help you to summarize the key points according to the time sequence. So I think there are a lot of things. The key thing is you have to do it. You have to get your hands on. The moment you say, I don't know, that uh, means you miss a lot of opportunities. Um, uh, it, it's very interesting that I found the people who use it more, there are less resistance. The people who don't use it will, will say, I have A, B, C, D, E, all these concerns, because they never use it. So my suggestion is get your hands on first, um, then, then, then basically try a lot of different tools. There are so many different tools today in the market then you will see the potential of AI. Thanks, Ilan. Um, Rimi, over to you. Is it, is it just a question of, of just being willing to experiment more? You're on mute. Sorry. I hope that wouldn't happen today, but it did. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good evening. I, I think, you know, uh, like Arun mentioned, it's exciting to see great participation from across the world. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I agree with Ilan, you know, I mean, I think there is this this sense of resistance when you don't know about it. And um, AI as a topic, I mean, has been discussed. It's penetrating, I think, every industry. Um, I read somewhere that it's uh, being uh, likened to the discovery of electricity, which means that, you know, that's really how um, it will it, it, you know, the, the scope and um, uh, impact of it uh, is going to be, you know, as far reaching as one can imagine. Um, let's just go back. I mean, you know, when Google first came in or when we were used to doing media monitoring physically, you know, back in the day, I think there are people on the call who may not know this, but 20 years ago, we used to wake up early, you know, go to the office early, pick up the 10 newspapers and read physically and track and then cut. So, you know, you that seems like, a, 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 you know, like a decade, like, I mean, decades ago, you think that you're back in the Stone Age. But today, it's everything is at a click of a button. And when Google, etc., you know, when the internet came in, we didn't know how to use it either. But our lives today are completely surrounded, uh, you know, and completely impacted with the technology. So to my mind, I think it's one of those, you know, one of those fast and coming trends that uh, we cannot escape. So it's best to befriend it. It's best to make it your ally and be clever, be ahead of the trend to understand how you can use it and how you can partner with it. Because what's understandable is that, yes, it is technology and technology will only be as useful as you can make it. So I think in terms of, you know, really looking at what the possibilities are, how we can make it your, how you can make it your friend, how you can utilize it so that you get smarter. I think that's the, that's really the opportunity. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, one can understand, yes, it compresses great amount of data. Uh, it's able to analyze, it's able to give you, you know, simulations, it's able to give you a different perspective. Um, and um, um, I don't know, I'm one of those, you know, 60% of those people from the, like, like the conference, uh, you know, uh, conference board data, 
that uses it in daily work. I'm trying. Um, and I think that all of us, I mean, you know, maybe some uh, due to practice or um, pushed being in situations uh, where we are able to use it more. But I think we're all skimming the surface and we are all discovering. So I think there's nothing to be afraid of. It's really about being on this journey together, learning from each other. And my pitch is that, you know, really befriend it and become smarter with those tools uh, rather than block it and not worry about, you know, how it's going to impact, impact you and your job. Be smarter, be ahead, be ahead of the curve, understand how you can, you know, work with it and, you know, the pitfalls. I mean, I'm sure that when we're preparing for these kind of meetings as well, I mean, I looked at ChatGPT to, to see, you know, what are the trends like, what, what it is. So it's just something that's normal. I think embracing it is, I, I would say, the name of the game at the moment. Thanks, Rumi. Sulin, over, over to you. Do, do you think that there is perhaps a, a certain element of fear in terms of how AI is transforming the mm -hmm. corporate comms uh, and PR landscape today. Yeah, thank you, Arun. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you again online. Now, um, I agree with Ilan and Rimi. Um, however, I think um, I like to uh, add a note of uh, caution. Now, of course, uh, being educated on it and making sure that we are all very familiar with AI uh, has has a purpose, right? Because ultimately our job has to be centered on transparency, ethics, and authenticity. At the end of the day, what do you use it for? It's really to build trust and it's really to build reputation for your organization. Now, I think AI is a good tool to use. It's a good aid, but it cannot replace some of the strategy work that you're gonna have to uh, look into and work on. So befriending it is more so that you can be educated on it, you can be aware of uh, what are the pitfalls, uh, what are the risks when you use it, but don't over rely on it. I think uh, that is uh, something that can be very dangerous because once you start relying on it, and it's very natural for us to you know, ultimately uh, farm our memory to Google, farm our creativity to Google, farm our work to Google, or um, even to AI uh, subsequently. And at the end of the day, we find that there is nothing original. Uh, everything that you say pretty much resonate with everybody else because everyone is just using the same tool. So from stakeholders' perspective, and if an organization wants to build on brand and reputation, I think you've got to be very careful uh, on how you use it because an approach centered on transparency, trust, ethics, and authenticity ultimately should be uh uh, driving how you use this tool. So being educated on it, yes, is very important. Learn it, yes, is very important. But ultimately, you need to be the one making decisions as to how you are going to uh, use it in order for outputs and outcomes which best fit and will advance uh, your corporate uh, social as well as business goals. Yeah, thanks, Sudin. I think really important points, and, and and I suspect we will return um, to some of those uh, some of those issues in terms of trust and transparency. Um, before that, though, and I saw we already have a question on this on the chat, so it makes sense now. Um, there are a vast array of AI tools available. Um, different, uh, they, they some of them perform different tasks better than others. Um, or, or at least claim to. Um, and it can seem quite bewildering, I think, the range of tools that are available. Um, I guess the question is, how can public relations professionals choose the most appropriate tools? Um, are there any that the three of you would recommend? Um, any advice and guidance on this area? Elan, over to you. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Now uh, we all started from ChatGPT, everybody. <laughs> so um, there's plenty to explore already at ChatGPT, frankly, and it's the most important and helpful tool today in our office. Today we're exploring Copilot, especially when it's installed with uh, Microsoft softwares. We are still on our way to understand how to best leverage it, but I can foresee in future it will be a part of our life too. 
Then there are vast tools available in the market. So we hired a consultancy firm. We asked the consultancy firm to search according to our workflow. What are the tools available in the market? Okay, so in we have you, you know we have China, which is quite separate. Then we have everywhere outside of China in Asia. So outside of China in Asia, our RFI studio is taking this role. So they are testing all the different products based on different uh, workflow. And they're gonna show us some of the products and telling us this fits which um, kind of responsibility. But in China, because of the limitations, we've hired a, a consultancy firm who is testing all the products. I think next week they're gonna present us with 20 offerings in the market um, based on our needs. Then we will have a small test group to tell him, the consultancy, that uh, which are the products we're gonna use and test first. That's how we handle that. There's no way for us to uh, try every um, every product by ourselves. It's just mission impossible. But that's uh, we will call it the second step. The first step is get your hands on. The second step is understand what are the tools available. Once I think we'll I'll give them like two months or three months. When once they get familiar with tools, we'll be speaking to decide whether we want to tailor make tools for ourselves because some of the um, products you want to keep it in a exclude environment because of confidentiality and uh, expertise reasons. But that will be step three because we need to figure out um, the tools in the market first. Thanks, Alan. That sounds quite advanced. Um, in terms of uh, of how you're experimenting uh, and and integrating uh, we, AI tools, we are literally working very hard on that. Mm, okay, Remy, um, how are you uh, finding the the tool landscape, and do you think that uh, perhaps this is contributing to uh, you know a sense of perhaps resistance amongst users? No, I agree. I mean, I was intimidated. You know, once mm -hmm. you, it's 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 like uh, you feel like um, Alice. You know, once you get down the black hole, um, there's no coming back because you realize there is so much more, and and you it's it's a very humbling experience as well because you realize there is so much you don't know. Um, um, I'll be honest, I'm really you know right at the surface, uh, just looking through the black hole in that sense because, um, you know, as Elaine said. Chat GPT when it came in, it was this whole thing about, okay, let's explore it. So we did start with that. Um, and now with the organization implementing Copilot, uh, and then, you know, we are getting trained, uh, we are learning how to use it, you know, how flexible the tool is, how vast it is, et cetera. So um, really looking at that. And I, and I think that, you know, from an organizational standpoint, there is a responsibility as well uh, in being able to train and being able to you know, generate that kind of confidence with people. Um, and as, um, um, you know, as Professor mentioned, it's it's also about like, you know, being ethical and transparent about this journey. So we are doing that um, and really getting to the point where we feel comfortable. Um, ESG and uh, sustainability, of course, is a you know huge part of you know what we do, and I think we are looking at tools and and areas that we can you know utilize AI better in in that area. But I think we are we're really learning. We're really on that learning path uh, and journey at this point. Um, so taking baby steps towards uh, towards the big big picture, I think that's really where we are. Sulin, your thoughts on um, how uh, how people can find and choose the best tools for them? Um, well, I am in a university, so uh, I can only say that from the academics perspective, the tool that we are comfortable to using and we are equally fearful of using is actually ChatGPT. Uh, simply for a very clear reason, because when we give out assignments to our students, ethics uh, and the ability to learn is very important. We don't want to have students, you know, churning out papers, essays, copying everything wholesale from Chat GPT. Uh, but then again, we recognize that that's something which we can't um, run away from uh, unless you have a lot of uh, parameters and then you keep them out from doing all of these. But then the university, we ourselves uh, are developing our other forms of software as well as 
so-called AI uh, to catch people from using uh, AI and uh, doing it unethically as well. So uh, uh, to your question, um, I think I'm able to only um, discuss on, on chat GP, uh, chat GPT because uh, I'm in a field where there isn't a need nor is there um, an importance on placing the importance of different AI tools. Uh, so chat GPT is probably the one that you know we use more frequently. Um, at the same time, we also need to ensure that for our type of work and 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 making sure that all our students are ethical on how they produce their work, uh, we are developing our own tools. And we need to develop our own tools because there's a lot of confidential information. There's a lot of um, data that the university turns out. And therefore, um, uh, those customized and tailored tools are critical for the university as well. Yeah, and it's needed in order to protect our um, integrity and all the confidential information from going out beyond the university. Yeah, well, that's very interesting because, you know, one of the key findings, of course, um, from the comms index, almost half of respondents um, said they were concerned that generative AI tools cannot handle complex and sensitive information. That was their number one concern. And I suspect, that, as you've mentioned, Sudan, it's a concern for everyone, um, you know, whether it's corporates or whether it's agencies handling um, sensitive corporate information and we have seen i think you know a few concerning stories um about data misuse uh, in terms of some of these generative ai tools so Rimi, perhaps i can come to you next um how are you tackling this particular challenge um i think it's it's really about you know how how do i say this it's it's being very collaborative with it's being very, you know, the need to be very collaborative with legal, with audit systems, um, and also to trust the ability and authenticity of our team. So it all has to come together. I think, you know, to be able to um, trust our teams to use the tools effectively, that's one. But, you know, to be able to, from an organizational point of view, restrict access or look at, you know, putting more security protocols in place but also working uh, closely with legal to see what are the policies that we can bring together um, um, and doing regular audits, because I mean, you know, in that sense, it, if, if, it's, if it's a bug, it'll get repeated. If it's something that's already in the system that is wrong, it'll get repeated. So how do we kind of break that chain as well? So to be able to pay, put audit systems in place, uh, regularly monitoring, working with legal in terms of, you know, what are the uh, disclosures that, that we need to do how do we prevent a misuse of this data, et cetera. So I think that's those are the conversations that we are being part of at the moment. Um, and, and really, um, I, I think from an organization point of view, it is also, you know, the, the, the take is similar that, you know, how do we embrace this and how do we get smarter in the process? Um, how do we get more efficient in the process? So in order to be able to do that, how do we empower our systems and processes uh, to be able to get to that point? I think so, like I said, it's still, you know, in that exploratory stage, we're having these conversations um, in terms of also being, um, you know, ethical communications professionals. To what extent do we say that, you know, we use, um, you know, use of AI for developing this report or, or or generating this content? And I think that one of the one of the key conversations that, you know, ha are happening is we've understood that there will always be a human element and that, that AI cannot function on its own separately. Um, and as long as there is a human element, you know, that there, there is that check and balance and also sensitivity and nuances are taken care of. Um, I think that's the encouragement from an organizational standpoint to say, um, include that human element and have that check and balance in place at this point. So we are all responsible um, and, you know, carry that flag of transparency and, and ethics to take this forward. But um, sure enough, Arun, I think it's a matter of time. You know, we will look at organizational um, policies and processes, um, uh, you know, to drive there. So it, it's just a matter of time. It's going to happen very quickly, sooner than we imagine. Sure. Elan, how are you seeing it? Are you seeing client concerns um, about sensitive information? And are, are there safeguards um, that you're putting into place? We have 
done it arbitrary <laughs> so, mm -hmm. because it's too difficult at this moment um, to judge which is confidential, which is not. So we decide two things. First, what uh, usually considered to be confidential will always be confidential, such as finance um, information, um, HR document contracts, all these always confidential. It not You are even not supposed to ask online. Um, the second thing is about some of the clients uh, we asked, especially um, internet clients, you will find some of them said very clearly, our documents and the working on, our, on this account um, cannot use AI. So some of the clients, everything just like no AI, <laughs> okay? Um, that's the two arbitrary um, measurements that we've put in place. The other things I agree with Remy that you really need to judge on common sense. You know what can be can do and what cannot do. Uh, we are working on a internal compliance um, document at this moment, not finalized yet, and so uh, it's still in progress. Yes, I I, I suspect. Um, I mean, it's similar responses from from you and Remy. It's it's kind of work in progress but I suspect we will see plenty of activity on this front. Su Lin, I wonder if I could ask you perhaps a slightly broader question. These concerns around ethics, around governance, around sensitive information, do you think the use of, um, of AI has implications um, for um, you know, public trust in institutions in general? Um, and how do you see communicators playing a role in that? Um, it definitely does, um, Arun. You know, uh, when when we all use AI, uh, sometimes we are unaware or some of our colleagues are unaware uh, that we are inputting information uh, in the system to kind of like help us generate content, right? So say, for example, you want to uh, whip up a press release or you want to have some content coming back to you to kind of like help you to give ideas to a piece of communications collaterals. But in the process, you inevitably un unaware, uh, and, it, and it's because we are not conscious of that, input certain information into the machine, which are confidential. So I think um, the, the implementation and the carrying out of the works in getting these machines to kind of like help us uh, is, the line is very, uh, very, very gray. So we've got to uh, be very clear as to what we have to input into this machine so that we want the machine to come back uh, to us with content that kind of help us. But in the event, we could uh, be giving information to the machine, which is confidential, that we may not even realize uh, ultimately because we thought this machine uh, is, kind of, is our aid, is a tool to kind of help us. So I think we've got to be uh, very, uh, very, very clear and very um, aware of that. Now, I think one of the ways to counteract this and to prevent this, uh, this particular mitigate, this particular risk is to not at all use it uh, for information or even to generate ideas, particularly if you know that set of information is going to be highly confidential. So, you know, in that case, then, you know, you should already have certain structure which the machine would be able to produce for you certain ideas, certain sentiments, uh, monitoring for, you know, uh, what kind of um, overall big data uh, that the analytics is able to keep up, is, are capable in giving it to you. And then subsequently use that to generate your own um, communications works or tasks, which evolve the sensitive um, information. So I think, you know, practitioners have to be very certain that they don't farm out everything to the machine because ultimately the machine is a machine, right? So you, like Remy says, uh, you need actually uh, the, the thoughts, uh, the human uh, a person to actually decipher that. And I, I, and I think if you are going to use the machine for menial, for structure, for monitoring, I think that's very good. But you know, sensitive information, I think um, you've got to be very clear how you're going to be using that because one misstep, one miscue or one, you know, uh, typing of information or one set of data that's going in and um, can actually cost uh, the organization backlash or, you know, um, uh, trust and all that that's going to be, um, you know, uh, un un very unpleasant for the organization itself. Um in the university, um, we are very stringent uh, about information going out. Like 
uh, for myself, even students, um, data, students, uh, names, and uh, certain matriculation number cannot be released to the public. And somehow uh, there are systems and there are uh, IT software that kind of like captures it uh, based on keywords. Uh, for example, you say, oh, student, um, you know, student information on exams or something like that. And straight away, you'll be blocked. And it cannot go out beyond my server, for example, and it cannot go out beyond the SMU uh, environment. So developing our own at the university, I'm talking about that uh, on a university level, uh, developing that at a university is super important for us. Uh, everything is copyrighted. Everything, you know, uh, it's, um, it, it belongs to the university, even our research, even, you know, our data that we produce, it all belongs to the university. And hence, um, uh, we, we take a very, very stringent, uh, very clear parameters when it comes to information, uh, whether it is sensitive or sometimes may not even be sensitive, and yet it's uh, being prevented from leaving, you know, the, this whole university server. Yeah. So I'm not sure, um, you know, how that actually pans out and how companies or corporates can uh, mitigate that. Um, yeah, I think... You know, that's something maybe perhaps, you know, um, you know, Ilan or Rimi or any other um, folks uh, in the panel can actually enlighten us on this. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ilan and, and Rimi, then over over to you. I don't know which of you wants to go yeah, first, just, but um, yeah, go ahead, Rimi. Just to build on that, uh, Aaron and uh, Sulin, I think that it, it's, you know, it's a then it's a broader discussion around accountability as well, right, in the sense that I mean, who is responsible and account, accountable if an AI algorithm does something which is unexpected and wrong? Is it the person who's inputting? Is it the organization who's probably not put the check and balance in place? I mean, it begs a bigger conversation in terms of where does this accountability lie? And I think like, like I mentioned earlier as well, we're all on this journey and we're learning, but these are the watch outs potentially. Um, Straight away, like you said, uh, Sulen, I mean, certain things, you know, the server blocks off. That intelligence exists within the system. But in terms of, and 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 I completely agree with you, Ilan, I think the, the, you know, the take is that what is confidential will always remain confidential because at this point, you don't know the impact, the far-reaching impact of where it could go. But at the same time, I mean, you know, it's this, this human touch and this hat that we need to be wearing constantly when using technology like generative AI. Um, to be responsible and to be accountable, because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, the the what we what we understand, the infinite possibilities can also be infinite possibilities of what could go wrong. Um, and I think just just to be able to be aware and understand that. So it's I think it's important about who uses the technology at what level the maturity exists within the organization as well, like, you know, from, from uh, you know, empowering our people, um, but to be empowering with responsibility. I think that's like, that's the, that's the build I have. It's really about accountability, uh, both from an individual as well as an organizational standpoint. Elan, are, are you ready for the era of the um, AI crisis? <laughs> okay. So um, I don't have a perfect answer to that. I mean, Remy and uh, Suling, so I, I think we are all exploring. Um, as I said, at, right now, we are only using arbitrary judgment, um, but I think it's a very big issue that uh, our legal compliance, all of them should get involved. Uh, I, I don't have a perfect answer to that. But one thing for sure, um, I think we need to be fully aware of the risk uh, when we structure and go forward with all the AI implementations, that's something we should always bear in mind. Rather than just go, you know, we should always be sensitive. There are some risks there and think about how to prevent some, some kind of dangers um, ahead of the time. So th that's what I can say right now. Yeah. And I think um, that's exactly what Ilan and uh, Rimi was talking about, uh, you know, getting our comms practitioners and professionals to be more friendly with AI. And it's not to be friendly so that we want to be over-reliant. I think we need to be friendly. We need to understand. We need to be educated on it so that we can uh, know how to navigate ourselves away from the risks. 
right? Yeah, but if we don't, then um, obviously you either reject it completely or you think that it can be used for all your solutions. And I think but that's the, where the danger lies, yeah. This is the time I think we should learn how to use external advisors. You, you know, sometimes we think we know everything and we do everything. No, um, that's the time IT person, legal should get involved because it's not only PS problem. It's not only communication industry facing the risk. It's everybody in this world. It's a problem everyone need to understand, address and in, in future put in place, right? So believe some of the big companies already take this seriously. Some of the firms already work on that. So we should work together with external resources and people who have expertise, expertise in that area. Yeah, to take from what something something Elaine said in terms of how we use it, I mean, I see it as as a well, you know, and it's a well which is, you know, tumbling with water. You have that, in, and it's an opportunity to draw from that well and make use of it as much as you need versus be able to jump into it without, you know, knowing what the risks are, right? So it's really about utilizing that resources available for you. Draw from it, learn from it, practice, use it, get drenched in it in that sense of the term versus being able to jump in without a harness at this point in time. Great, thank you all. Um, so before we uh, go to the floor for questions, I just wanted to ask um, about the ESG findings as well, because uh, I don't want to overlook those. Um, and so a very simple question. Um, do, uh, all of you, do you, are you all seeing ESG um, continuing uh, as a major driver of corporate communications in this region? And are you seeing um, any evidence of a backlash? So, Elan, I'll come to you first, if you, if you don't mind. Um, interesting. I've heard a lot of backlash. Um, I didn't see literally one. So um, that's always my question, whether the backlash is a talk topic, it's a talking topic, or it's literally happening. From my perspective, ESG in Asia, it's that we're not doing enough. It's not that we've, we've already overdone it. No, we, we still need to catch up. <laughs> So um, in terms of the environmental initiatives, in terms of the um, DEI initiatives, there are still plenty for us to catch up. So, so far, I don't really see uh, um, a backlash. And also it's very important um, that we, we understand the content of ESG is different in different continents. Some, of, some, some topics are especially important in Asia, for instance, the woman, woman and human rights, right? Um, the poor area education, um, that we should pay special attention to those areas. So um, I, I didn't see a backlash. Um, I actually think we can do better. Thank you, Remy. I am a bit of an optimist. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm a fool and I don't understand the risks, but I'm a bit of an optimist, and I do think that. There is so much we can explore and learn, uh, you know, by using the tools to to really further our ESG agenda and, and goals. Um, I think it can really be a source of, you know, being able to provide us accurate and reliable information, um, help us compare like to like and otherwise with, you know, other companies and in industries as, as well. Um, I mean, again, I think just understanding that it's an inevitable. I mean, there was a World Economic Forum article which basically said that without AI, we won't meet ESG goals and address climate change. So that's the kind of conversation, you know, that's going on. And I think, you know, not looking at that big picture is probably restrictive. And the backlash, I mean, technology, we we all came from Y2K. We all came from things like, you know, there's it's everything's going to shut down. Everything is not, not going to work. And I think that it's really a sign of the times that look, this is here, um, and you can talk, you can argue that even the servers that that host the AI apps, you know, will consume crazy amount of uh, energy and electricity, and that's going to impact the world as well. But, but, but I think there is greater potential in in being able to work with the tools, and and I feel like. Um, you know, we, we again, I, I, I go back to that point. I think we are really skimming the surface and we've not understood or learning in the process to 
um, to embrace those endless possibilities. I mean, um, there is there, there are articles also available which talk about you know how companies like Shell um, have used the uh, AI-based predictive maintenance uh, tools to be able to deliver a safer and cleaner and more sustainable energy. So again, it's you know companies who can be ahead of the curve to be able to understand how we can use it to the benefit of furthering the uh, ESG goals, understanding the scope one, scope two, scope three. Um, you know, um, and linking it to the SGDs, I think those are opportunities where we could be very limited from um, from an organizational standpoint or from an industry standpoint. But really, to be able to um, broaden our perspectives and learn, um, it's a great tool. So I I really feel like, and I and I agree with Elaine, the the black backlash conversation is limited. It's going to be there, um, but we've got to see how. I think how we can use it for the positive use uh, more than looking at what the negative impact would be. Sure. Ram Sulin, uh, how do you see progress of, uh, of ESG uh, for corporate comms uh, people thanks. in Asia? Yeah, um, well, I agree with Ilan and Rumi that, you know, um, the advocacy and the push for ESG uh, is not as strong uh, in Asia. Um, I, think, I think there are a couple of reasons behind this. Now, Asia being Asia, uh, that not that there are no advocacy, but I think the, um, the the passion is more nationalism, it's more religion, it's more ethnicity, it's all of these which actually dominate more uh, advocacy kind of activities uh, and and drives people's passion. Now ESG uh, is obviously an up and coming important issues. Uh, and I think many Asians have yet to be educated on the importance of that uh, and how it actually impacts the society. Some countries are more advanced than others. Some are still grappling with you know, um, wealth inequality and gaps in the country in order for certain segments or the majority of the segments to actually uh, appreciate the importance of ESG. Now, having said that, for many Asian communications practitioners in Asia, I think we've got to be very careful too in our push for ESG. Which aspect of ESG are you pushing out? And uh, why is the backlash more evident in a, in a state, for example, uh, and not so much uh, in Asia? And if we are going to kind of like adopt this whole narrative in trying to leverage our reputation and to show that we are a responsible corporate citizen, I think it's important. But I think corporate comms folks should be able to and uh, aware of what aspect of it. Now, we don't want to end up greenwashing. We don't want to be an elusive green consumers either. Uh, we want to be responsible. Now, if you're not going to be able to walk your talk, for example, uh, then don't, don't scream so loudly, you know. And if you are able to walk your talk only maybe in certain aspects of the E or certain aspects of the S or certain aspects of the G, then just highlight and focus on that. But don't try to, uh, you know, tell the whole world or try to, uh, you know, enhance your brand by saying that, hey, I'm big on this and I can do everything uh, that um, sustainability or ESG uh, pro uh, propels. Because ultimately, if you're not going to be able to walk your talk, your narratives and all your communications work that is supposed to generate visibility will also uh, be expanded and made visible to uh, your audiences and your stakeholders in the West. And they have already come around uh, to, to a stage where they uh, are picking on organizations that cannot walk their talk and who are greenwashing. And that's where sometimes the backlash may come about. So we have to be careful as well. Yeah. But yes, yes we, have to, we have to do a lot of yeah, that. <laughs> it's an interesting, very interesting point I think you you raise. In fact, I've seen research recently that that indicates that in Asia, actually, that this trend towards green hushing um, is more of an issue here, where companies are are just much more cautious um, about proclaiming or about talking about their ESG progress, uh, because they're concerned, um, you know, they're not meeting perhaps some of the commitments that they, they may have made. Um, so they would rather not talk too much about it, which, of course, has a knock-on effect of, of them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, for, it doesn't necessarily encourage progress, I think, which yeah. is the concern. Um, uh, many studies in this this part of the world, especially Asia, showed that you know uh, they are aware and consumers are uh, are concerned, right? That corporates uh, are embracing you know certain aspects of ESG or corporate citizenship. Uh, but then you see the problem with you know uh, many Asians is that they love 
to make sure that their wallets are not hit as well. So when it comes to, you know, making sure that uh, their, an organization uh, does good works, oh, that's great, fine, but just don't make me pay for it. So at the end of the day, um, uh, Asians are very careful with their wallets. So how do you ensure that they translate action, in, uh, translate what they want into action? And I think that's the challenge of many organizations, that you may want to talk about it, you may want to increase the visibility, and you want to ensure that some of the costs, unfortunately, and this is the reality, goes to the consumers and that they're prepared to pay for it. Now, how do you actually balance uh, all of these uh, critical for an organization uh, moving forward when it, when they want to embrace and advance ESG narratives. Good points. Okay, I want to um, take questions from the floor. So if you have any, please feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we have one here from Stephen Thomas, um, who I assume is in Hong Kong. So uh, Stephen asks, from an agency viewpoint, are clients encouraging the use of AI or are they saying, we are not paying our agency to come up with ideas or write copy using AI tools. So Elan, maybe I'll come to you first for that one. Um, it's a great question. Actually, client don't care. <laughs> what we see client cares about, uh, clients care about the result, whether they get a great copy or not. It's only when they get a very bad copy, they will ask, is it come from AI rather than come from your team? So, so as long as they get good results, no matter it's the copy, it's the visual um, that uh, they're happy with. The question today is actually some of the Chinese clients are asking whether you can use AI to reduce your cost. They are thinking about um, the same amount of, pain, uh, I mean, creatives, the same amount of drafts. No, you know, you are using AI, so your cost must be reduced, so you shouldn't charge us that much. So you see, it's the reverse how clients see things, especially the video part. Today, using AI, you can make videos very fast, and it's a fraction of the cost um, compared to the past, right? So that's what we are facing today. Um, I assume in future we will see some of the costs further going down just because um, we're using AI technologies. Okay. Remy, um, do you care, first of all, and, and or are you expecting cost savings? It's an interesting point Elaine has raised, and I'm going to think about that because I I didn't, to be honest, think about the cost saving element. Um, I don't we you know we are very lean teams, right? So we we consider our agency partners to be our extended arms, and we want to be as efficient as possible. So for me, um, and I and I bring in that additional element of the human aspect. So yes, use the technology, but use your judgment and use your you know responsibility towards. To, our, to us as the client, but also to the project to be able to, um, you know, add your own intelligence and add your own nuance to it. So my expect there are there are times I see copy which I know is from from AI. It's AI generated, but then I think the push is to see how we can customize that and how you can bring in that um, that nuance that you know that an organization needs. So um, I don't really care. I I feel like if if it helps you, if it aids the process, if it brings speed and accuracy and efficiency, by all means use it. Um, but I think as extended arms of our own you know, organization, we do expect that level of maturity to be brought in uh, with every deliverable. So it's really about that. Thank you. Sulin, Sulin I don't know if you had any thoughts on that particular question. Yeah, um, I think this question is directed to agencies, right? Yeah, yeah so sure. I think, <laughs> sorry, I, I don't think I have uh, much to, no to share, Steve. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Um, any more questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat or Q&A. Um, so I'll ask uh, another question. Um, given everything we've talked about today, you know, the, the, the need to experiment, the need to embrace um, AI, um, the need to be kind of cognizant of the risks, um, the ethical concerns, safeguarding sensitive information, and then also some of the broader ESG trends, what skills are you looking for? Uh, in terms of, of how PR professionals um, should develop if they want to stay ahead uh, in this kind of an environment. Um, and I don't know if Sulin, maybe I could I could start with you first, please. Um, I 
think it is important. Uh, I'm I'm from of course the university, so uh, we train our uh, students uh, to be top candidates for top jobs in communications. Now, of course, we try to do our best, but one thing about being an SMU, which I appreciate, is that corporate communications and strict communications actually part in the business school. So that means that our students, number one, uh, have to be business savvy. And I think I have been uh, saying this um, for, for many years now, that comms practitioners have to be business savvy. They must understand finance. They must understand business. They must understand how communications drive business in order to actually add value uh, to the organization and be able to be on the same wavelength with CEOs and CFOs, for example, uh, so that they can talk sense and money as well, right? So I think that is uh, critical. That means, in other words, uh, being able to uh, be uh, um, business savvy, understanding business, uh, multidisciplinary, it's very important because today, whether it's ESG, whether it's AI, you know, you have to work with IT folks, you've got to work with human resource, you've got to work with legal, you've got to rework with all your other department business units. In other words, uh, being able to at least uh, understand uh, what they are doing. You don't have to be trained. You don't have to be, you know, have those skills. Like you don't have to be, you know, uh, uh, doing four years or three years uh, and understand all the content and finance or IT to be able to just uh, understand enough of what they do so that ultimately you can partner with them, you can work with them to ad advance uh, the communications uh, agenda. So uh, multidisciplinary, uh, business savvy uh, is key. And of course, you know, if, for the older practitioners uh, like myself. And, you know, uh, I think it's important for us to also uh, be aware of some of the tools in digital and be IT, you know, a little bit more IT savvy. Now for the younger folks, they are already very aware and they are already very uh, IT, um, you know, um, you know, uh, com comfortable with IT tools. So I think we should, be able to, and I think we should uh, make sure that strategy-wise, the ability to think, the ability to be able to curate content, which subsequently will advance, you know, uh, your organization, uh, corporate comms or branding or reputation-driven initiatives uh, is very important. Yeah. Actually, we have a, a related question to this, which I'll put to the panel. Is anyone um, aware of uh, it's a question from Darren Boy. Is anyone aware of uh, courses for comms practitioners uh, or educational modules on how to use AI tools um, effectively? Um, uh, at the university, I mean, uh, Darren, thanks for that question. Uh, at the university, I think uh, we have, um, but it's not uh, taught by me, by, my, but by my colleagues, yeah, on machine learning uh, in communication. So yes, we do have in SMU, uh, some of my colleagues who teach uh, the use of AI tools in communications. Uh, we also have many modules which are offered by my uh, colleagues in information and computer science that just teach you on AI, artificial AI, and what it does. So it actually depends on uh, on what you on what you want. Now, some of my colleagues uh, teach this uh, on an undergrad level, postgraduate level, uh, but I'm not sure whether they actually offer it to the executive uh, as well as the uh, you know commercial sure. workshops. But I will have to check on yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Elan and Remy, before we close, any final thoughts on uh, skills and learning? Um, I, I just give a suggestion because if you scan YouTube, you will see a lot of videos telling you how to use different AI tools. Um, I know it's all fractioned, um, but today AI's world is fractioned. So if you're interested, you probably need to follow some of the key bloggers who continue to give updates on AI. That will be the best learning tool with everyday involvement of the AI um, materials. In Chinese, if you want to proceed, you can go to Little Red Book. There are some very good teaching. Actually, it's it's very um, mature teaching courses on that you can pay for it. So that's where we send our team. Say, if you want, you just go there and learn it yourself. Remy, you get the final word. I would say um, 
firstly, be aware of what you bring to the table as a professional, as a student, as uh, as as a communications or a corporate affairs professional. Um, what are your strengths? I mean, I think it's important to, you know, in this ever-changing environment, understand that and understand how you can get ahead and superior to the machine. Um, because at the end of the day, it's it's only going to be as useful as you make it. Um, so without, you know, creating extra dependencies on technology, firstly, understand and assess where you stand and how you can up the game for yourself. Uh, how you can do better for your team, for your organization, and and really understand that you know there is this human element, there is this element of soft skill, there is this element of emotion, and you know kind of biases that we do, whether it's positive or negative, that do influence the kind of work we do. So I would say um, it's a time when you can really re-examine uh, where you stand, what you need to do to you know to to uh, you know increase your uh, AI literacy, technical competencies, um, understand the trends that are happening in, in, in the world and, you know, in the organization and in, in the industry that you're in, um, and really be able to bring confidence in yourself to say, yes, you will, you know, you, you know, this is, this is a tool, this is a, a helpful tool, it's going to probably take over the world, but it's, it's still going to be what I will make of it. And I think just to be able to um, ground yourself back um, and and see you know it's it's everything is a race and and how do you kind of race against this this technology and get superior uh, to the machine I think that's really um, the, the thought I'd like to leave everyone with. Yeah, I think it's a great point on which to end. Um, don't let the machine take you over. Uh, and with that, thank you so much to the panelists for some really great insights uh, into the evolution of AI and ESG. In Asia Pacific, the comms index findings you can find, by the way, uh, on Provoke Media's website or on APACD.com. Um, there's a lot more uh, research um, of in-house comms leads, and we will be coming out with um, the 2024 edition um, of the research as well later this year. So thank you all very much. And Brittany, back to you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you all so much. We'll link all of those resources to the recording, which will be available on our website within 48 hours. Please let us know if you have any other questions and stay tuned for the latest um, uh, Asian Pacific Comms Index coming up soon. And with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your day wherever you're located. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.